Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Reha Truth, Ellie. It's Thank so you. great to have you here. Thank you. Um, oh, it's going to be a really energetic interview. I can see that. Yes. It was so amazing how we sort of connected and how we both sort of are in the line of truth and we're tackling. Oh, tackling is not the right word, but we're looking at truth. Exploring? Yeah, exploring, exploring truth. Yes, that's a nice word. Thank yeah. you. Um, from different angles. And um, we're just going to have a bit of fun with it today. Um, so when I was reading your LinkedIn profile, you were saying, well, you weren't saying, but I, <laughs> I was reading that um, you work with government agencies to help them identify um, truths in interviewing, particularly when they interview to see when candidates are lying. So tell us a little bit about how you got into doing that. Okay, um, I think my, my interest in the topic of truth and deception started many years ago when I joined the police force, Victoria Police Force, and I graduated on my 22nd birthday and I thought I knew everything. And they, of course! <laughs> at 22. That would be all think that. And they gave, they gave me a gun and they gave me handcuffs and a baton and they sent us out to the streets of Melbourne and said, off you go, you know what to do, you're trained now. Like, yeah, off <laughs> we go. <laughs> but then in that same first week, we got called to the first real job, which was a shoplifter or suspected shoplifter at um, Maya, Melbourne. And so my partner and I, he'd also just graduated from the police academy. We thought, okay, this is the real thing. Yeah, it's the real deal. <laughs> yeah, so what are the points of proof for theft? So they drummed it into us in the academy, this is what you need to prove. This is what you need to show, certain points of proof. So we were walking to Maya, Melbourne, saying the points of proof over in our head, this is what we need to prove. So we, we got there and I remember, this is, quite a few years ago and there wasn't a C oh, CCTV no, ago. I yeah, I know, I was five years ago, I'm only 27. <laughs> and, um, and so here's this suspected shoplifter that the security people had, had sat in the back room. And I thought, I'll start, I know how to get the truth from him. And I said to him, you, you pretend you're him for a minute, okay? <laughs> and I said to him, so did you steal the jacket? No. Uh, and I thought, okay, come on, so identity, dishonestly appropriate property. I'm like, okay. oh, you just need to tell me the truth. Um, tell me the truth. Did you steal the jacket? No. <laughs> and it kind, of, it kind of went like that. Oh, I like this. <laughs> it kind of went like that. And I'm thinking, come on, what did I learn? What did I learn? How do I get the truth from someone? And so I had this little aha moment that, okay, in that context, how do you get the truth from somebody when it's against their own self-interest? Why, why should he tell me the truth when if he does tell me the truth, I'm going to put a brief of evidence together, he's going to go to court and if he's got prior convictions, he might end up in jail. Yeah. And so then I kind of looked back through the curriculum in the, in the police academy and thought, right, well, where did they teach us this? And they didn't. They, did, they taught us a lot about what we needed to get, but not wow. a lot about how to get it. So that's where my fascination started. And, and so I, I made it my business to sit in on a lot of interviews and watch expert police get the truth and what are, what are, what are, are the different ways. you interrogation? There's interrogation, there's good cop, bad cop, there's... Is it like the movies? There's, this is there's what all I of that and everything in between. There's like this to, to this and everything Which in between. Which way did you so, good cop or bad good cop? Good cop, always a good cop. But uh. the good cop stuff works better than the bad cops in my, in my book. Uh. But then many, many years later, I left the police force, joined the corporate world, um, but I saw the same thing out in the corporate world, people conducting job interviews, sales interviews, uh, any sort of situation where uh, eliciting information or getting the truth was important, which is most of our interactions. We don't want to be lied to. We don't you know, want that. But, and I saw that a lot of people didn't, they weren't really sure on what they were doing or how they were going about it, or how can I increase the likelihood of getting the truth in situations where there's a higher likelihood of somebody hiding it. And um, mm, but then sort of after I left the corporate world and, and decided to start my own business, I crossed paths with my now ex-business partner who was a polygraph operator. Mm. So it was kind of like this whole truth thing was in me and I was being channeled down a path that yeah. leads me here to the red hot truth. <laughs> totally. And it's like, it doesn't surprise me when I found you. I was like, okay, this is next. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of really much uh, very aligned. And um, so then we started a business that was focusing on teaching people that conducted interviews, whether they be police officers or business people. Or secret or agents. Or secret agents, <laughs> intelligence agents. Um, 
and salespeople, whatever. It doesn't matter. Even on the, the dating scene. Totally. <laughs> you're, you're conducting interviews Absolutely. when you're going Well, we always date. conduct interviews if you think about it. Exactly. Every interaction is, a, is sort of an interview, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. So, so we created these programs called Perceptive Interviewing that was all about uncovering and eliciting useful and truthful information. So I'm really fascinated with what I just, I just had a shift there because initially I was like, oh my God, she's like the human lie detector, right? She's going to teach us strategies on how to learn if someone's telling a lie, right? But what I heard you say was for the person interviewing, how do they create an opportunity for that person to tell the truth. Mm. So that's interesting. So how do you do that? It depends on so much. It depends on what's at stake. It depends on how I feel about you, how much I trust you. So looping back to that other question, um, situations where, yes, we can, we can work on lie spotting. So I'm interviewing you. Back to that scenario, I'm interviewing you. I can work on lie spotting. But the truth is around lie spotting, it's actually hard to do. We're crap at it. We're, we're not good at it. I don't know. Oh, women. I, I, I wonder. <laughs> well, wait, I want to go for some other, other tangent, but please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, we'll come back to that. Yeah. So we're actually not that good at it. Um, and they did some studies around the world, and the, the, the numbers came back around 52 to 54% of the time we get it right. We might as well toss a coin. Yeah, Teddy. So, okay, so knowing that we're actually not as good as we think we are, what can we do? Um, yes, we can improve that. We can improve that by understanding the psychology and the science of truth and lies. We can yeah. definitely take that from 50 to 60 to 70. But there's no one in my studies and all the work that I've done over the last 18 years, there's no one that I've come across that gets it right 100% of the time. Well, is it even possible? Like, no, that's and... it. And even so, 80% of the time, there's a group of people called truth wizards that have been tested that get it right sort of 80% of the time mm -hmm. frequently. But that's not the, the average person. So knowing that, that how difficult it is, so that the next step back is, all right, I need to increase the likelihood that I'm going to get the truth from you. What can I do to create a truth-telling environment? What can I do to condition you or prime you to be more truthful? Okay. So that's a better starting point. So you, how do we do that? Yeah, and it depends on the, the, the situation. I have to think what would be your motivation Oh, so why to identify motivation, I yes, suppose, yes. Yeah, so depending on the, the, the context, so in a dating, so we're back on a date again. Right? Hi. Yeah, let's bring it back. <laughs> and I have to think about why, why might you not tell me the truth? And and I want to impress you. Because you want to impress me. You don't want to tell me uh, about where you really live because you don't like where you live or you don't want to tell me that you are actually really married. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the set's over. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to sort of start to think, well, you know, what, what are some of the motivations for deception? Yeah. But also, sometimes we push truth away. So you might start telling me something about your what you'd like to do or... or um, Maybe you were in jail for a while, okay? Sure. <laughs> Let's go hard here. <laughs> and yeah. Back in the day. <laughs> now, that, that would be a hard thing for you to tell somebody yeah. on, a, on a date. Now, let's just say you kind of went there or you kind of were leading into that and I went, oh, or like, oh. Straight away, just I didn't even say anything. Yes. My face told you that's not something I'm going to impress, be impressed with. Yeah. So judgment starts to flow okay. and then your brain goes, I can't tell her that it, it's not safe. It isn't going to be safe okay. anymore for that. So, so we make judgment on, on what's coming to us and sometimes it's just an eye roll or, a, or right. <laughs> and then that signals to you, uh-uh, it's not safe to actually tell the truth. I, I, I can't tell. I can't tell the truth. You know, so much comes up for me here and the conditioning we, we sit out there. So I really want to um, look at this from our personal truth perspective now because it is about our red hot truth and so how do we tell if we lie to ourselves <laughs> or when we lie to ourselves um we can't always tell is the short answer mm. but um and i think that's a growth journey i think that um and my growth journey which is continual and will be on its way until my last breath and proactively sticking new knowledge in there all the time. I look back 
to last week, to last month, to last year, to last decade and think the beliefs that I had then, not all of them are what I hold now mm -hmm. about myself, about the people around me. And so looking forward, what I think is the truth now is not necessarily the truth tomorrow, yeah. next week, next week. Um, and I think that you know one of the important things I say to my coaching clients that I work with um, is to continually get new, new information in there because otherwise we get stuck in this loop sometimes mm. and we can be lying to ourselves and misleading ourselves and um, have a lack of self-belief. I can't do that. That's not possible. That's for someone else. Um, I'm not good enough. Yes. That's the big one. Yes. I'm not good enough. Um, I don't know enough. Nobody's going to want to listen to me. Yes. No one's going to want to read my book. No one's going to, I can't get that job. I can't get that promotion. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm yes. not old enough. I'm too old. I'm too fat. I'm too skinny. I'm too, yes. and it exhausting. just goes on and on and on. But once you believe that to be true, you get stuck in that loop, which becomes a limiting belief. We've all got them. We've all had it. Yeah. Um, so it's actually questioning that. Is that actually true? And you, you actually led me to Barbara Sher. Yes. <laughs> I had a look at her Was stuff. I supposed to send you something about that? It doesn't I'm matter. I found it. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm I, sorry. Since I, since I talked to you, I jumped into her stuff. Yeah, yeah. Isn't she a gem? I know. Isn't she totally oh. awesome? And, and, she, and, and, and I just jumped on board to that bandwagon with, yeah, she's just all about, you want it? Get it. Go get it. Yeah, and also and the nice thing about her is like, but she is isolation is the killer of dreams. So work together with oh, people, right? Yes. Yeah. And so and so as you were saying, when we do lie to ourselves, we so self centered. Mm. We so in the self, and it's really important to then go and break out of that. And so I'm interested in how you say get more knowledge. Mm. But for me, what I've noticed lately is um, knowledge is nothing because it's someone else's truth. The only thing I ever know to be true for myself is my own experience. Mm. So then a beautiful um, thing that you just said is like, ask yourself better questions once, one, and also try and prove yourself wrong. Yes. Prove yourself yeah. wrong, you know. And go and do that through experience. Yeah. And I, I'm interested because I think this is what happens. We get too much knowledge. We lose sight of our own truth. And that's when those doubts start coming in, mm. right? So I encourage people to go and live the experience. You know, stop learning and start doing a little bit. Mm. Because sometimes you can get so confused in truth if you're just learning, right? And that's and I only say that because I have experienced that myself. I'm a, an absolute monster for knowledge. Mm. I like love it. Mm. I love learning, but eventually, sometimes because often stuff's conflicting, right? Mm. Mm. And then I question myself, and and then I forget my own truth. And I think that for me is a real danger point for me. Yes. So I wonder if having more knowledge is really a good way to get truth. Yeah, that's really good point too. I think you can, I, I think if you're just um, ingesting, is that the right word? Ingesting. Yes. Yes, di ingesting. Ingesting, yeah. Ingesting, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but not actually doing anything with yes. it. Yes. Or, or, and there's how many self-help books are there out there? You know, it's, it, it's, not, a, it's not actually that people aren't, um, that there's no resources, it's about not being resourceful. Um, there's plenty of resources, plenty of resources, plenty, plenty. So it's finding what, and I think I think you need to follow your inner compass on that. So when you mentioned Barbara Sher, I thought, okay, I like Petra. Petra's referred me to someone that she likes. I'm going to have a look at that and see yes. how that sits for me. I started watching her stuff and I actually got goosebumps straight away. Thank like, you. oh my God, I love, I love her so much. And then I saw that she was a little bit older and I'm thinking, is she still alive? And I Googled, <laughs> I Googled she is still alive. And, and I'm like, oh God, she's 78 or something like that. Is she? Yeah. Wow, yeah. she's old. And wow. um, so I emailed her, sort of like, hi. I was on it too. I had to take over the show, but she wasn't kidding. Yeah, yeah. And, too busy. And, but so, but then, so I don't think it's actually, let's read everything you can get your hands on. Or well, let's listen. I'm audio. I'm a big audio, yeah. audio book fan. So um, it's actually about following that. Go down that rabbit hole that feels feels right at that time. And you might get nothing down the rabbit hole, or it might even mislead you, or you come out with rabbit poo. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't matter. But also, you might come out with a gem. And sometimes it's actually just 
a phrase or a sentence or this golden nugget that you go, oh my God. Yeah. I get that. Yeah, it's so awesome. And three things I want to comment on there is um, intentionality. So know why you're doing mm, something. Mm-hmm. Like that's really interesting, Agreed. right? So, and that's one thing I really had to learn is because I do, I'm a, like, I'm a self-help junkie, man. I, it's my life, my cocaine, right? <laughs> but you said about inten- intentionality. Yes. So actually thinking, what, what am I, you don't always know what you need. Otherwise you go and get it. But you can know um, a little bit about um, the gap. Now, again, let's introduce Brené Brown into the story. Yay! So I'm a Brené junkie. We should junkie. be paid for advertising. So we should, shouldn't we? Um, if, you, if you haven't got onto the Brené Brown bandwagon, <laughs> jump on. So she talks about, um, uh, I can't remember exactly, but the gap. The gap from where you are and where you want to be. Yes. And recognising, all right, there is a gap as a yep, start, of course. which is an honesty piece right there because some people don't even recognise that they're a gap. It's like, I got it all sorted, I got my shit together, it's you that doesn't have your shit together <laughs> um, and why don't you get yourself sorted and why don't you just listen to my way because my way is right and yours is wrong. Mm. If you can recognise, all right, I still got some growth to do, but then be strategic about how might I fill that gap, how might, where, you don't need to know the answers, but that's your intentionality there is going, I'm going to go and search for somebody that can help me with this struggle that I've got going on in my head or this, the story that keeps looping that tells me that I'm not good enough yeah. or the, the story that keeps telling me that I'm a bad parent and I stuffed up and I did wrong and my kids will never love me again. And, and I've got some personal stuff that I'm weaving into this because I've got some of that going on for me. Yeah. And, and I, and the, the rabbit hole I went down was discovering the power of shame and how the difference between shame and guilt. And that's all Brené's stuff. Yeah. And so only recently I've had this aha. I was like, oh, my God, crap. Like I thought I had guilt, but it's actually with some shame. And, then I, <laughs> and it's different. And oh, it's different. It? It's, it's a different thing. It feels, it feels and, and different. You, and so then you, then you kind of – then you start to question your truth about self and, and then how you were and now how you are and how you want to be in the uh, and it gets really deep and you, as Brene says it, you don't get any of that growth without pain yeah that that personal growth and that self-truth to hold a mirror up to yourself it's easy to hold up to someone else and go hey look at you yeah easy right <laughs> hold up to yourself in a really authentic raw way and be yeah. prepared to do the work on yourself yeah and you can't do that without pain if it if there's no pain you're not deep enough. <laughs> you're not deep <laughs> enough you're still on the surface level telling everyone else what they should do yeah it's interesting because um suffering is so self-imposed right it's so interesting and it's where we measure our own truth by someone else's truth that's when we experience suffering. But shame only comes from believing you should be a certain way, you should have behaved a certain way, and you didn't, and therefore you feel shameful, mm-hmm. right? About self and not about the thing. Yes, so The guilt equally. is about the thing. Oh, my God, I'm so, I'm so bad that I forgot your birthday. Yeah. Or whatever, but the, the, the thing, but then it's like I'm a bad person. Yes, for is doing Is the shame it. thing, and then you let... Seriously, shame can just snowball. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because, um, but whatever, and I you know Brene Brown makes that clear distinction, which is really helpful. But at the end of the day, it's comparing ourselves to a standard we didn't set. Yeah, okay. and it always is. Yeah, guilt or shame or yeah. whatever is always comparing ourselves to a standard we didn't set. Yeah. It's someone else's standard. Yeah. So really, at the end of the day, we're measuring ourselves against that someone else's truth, someone else's standard. And when the mm. pain comes in, I th- this is my opinion, mm. the suffering only comes in because we are so used to not looking at our own truth and we think it's such a bad thing that that's where the suffering comes in because mm. we've, we've got this identity. Mm-hmm. But if we could mm-hmm. just go, let go of who we think we should be mm. and just go, this is who I am now, mm. not who I was two seconds ago or 10 years mm-hmm. ago. If we can just go, this is who I am now and that's okay. Mm. 
then there's no suffering. We're all seeking joy. We're all seeking happiness. That's it. That's it. That's all. Always. So go back to that. Go back to that truth. And yes or no, am I where I need to be? Yes, no. What's the gap? Where do I want to be? I want to be more joyful. I want to wake up in the morning and go, Hoo-hoo! I want to enjoy my job. I want to um, fulfill my other dreams and ambitions. I want to have a great partner by my side. I want to feel respected and loved for who I am and what I'm capable of. So here's the gap then put the strategies in in place to do it and that you need to take responsibility for. So once again, we're looking for happiness externally, right? When I have the job, when I have the the partner, when I have this, and that's why we get unhappy. So the only reason for suffering really is when we have a desire and the desire is not met. That's it. It's literally as simple as that. Mm. I went to the lover, didn't get the lover. Went to the car, didn't get the car. That is the reason why we suffer. That's it. It's as simple as that, right? But if we start looking at our own truth and going, I'm just happy because. And I keep referring to kids. You look at kids, they're just happy because. Mm. So if when you start understanding that your life is programming and the only thing you know to be true is your own experience. I heard this really beautiful thing the other day saying, other than the books and the podcasts and the videos you've watched, who of you know God? Who of you know God? Mm. And it was more like a universal thing, but no one. <laughs> no. You don't, mm. right? But yet God's used everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. God's used for this and that and the excuses, wars, religions, whatever. But no one actually knows God. Well, I don't know if no one knows, but, you know, (laughs) and so, I can't say that. that. I'd like to, to like substantiate my point. But, um, (laughs) so, what I'm I'm saying is the reason it's so important to come back to your own truth is so you can really live your own life. And then that's why I just think to myself, if someone's lying to me, so what? Like, it's not a big deal. Like, you know, it could be. It could be because my desire is not met. Does that yeah. make sense? Like, I mean, yes, if I act on what you're telling me and it's causing me X, Y, and Z, I get that from a business perspective or yeah. something. If right? you make an investment decision based on misinformation and then all totally. your money is gone, then that lie does matter. Of course. If I tell you that I live in a suburb that I don't, so what? You know, yeah, so. Totally. It's about the impact. It's about also the decision that you make based on that information that's come to you or the action that you take or what it caused you to do. And so at the end of the day, it's always my decision though. Yes. Right. So I've looked at the information, I've trusted you and so I've made this decision, but at the end of the day, the decision was always mine. Mm. So therefore I can never blame you for anything. No. You see how that, you see how important it is to always come back to our truth. But we don't, yep. and therefore we're so obsessed with so other people much lying to, to blame us. Other people, right? You lied to me, so it's your fault that uh-huh. I invested all my money <laughs> over <laughs> here because you lied to me. Because <laughs> yeah. so, let's just have a quick look. Um, tell me about the five truth circles. I saw something coming up there. Mm, okay, so um, about a year ago, uh, when I did a big brainstorm, I had whiteboards and butcher's paper everywhere and was working out which direction I wanted to take my next, my next step. And so I came up with this model called the five truth circles and all it is, it's nothing complex, it's, it's just looking at truth through different lenses. Okay. We started with spotting hidden truth or spotting deception. We started talking about that and my experience in the police force. So that's one aspect of truth is spotting when somebody is telling a lie, which is not that hard, not that easy to do. Um, but we're all interested to do it. We like watching the crime shows. Yeah. <laughs> we like watching CSI. Lie to Me and CSI. Uh, and, and, and in those shows, they solve seven crimes in 30 minutes. And, uh, <laughs> and they are beautiful. <laughs> What's wrong, baby? Are my hairs out of place? Yeah. Oh. So they're not realistic. It's not how it works. So that's one of the truth circles is spot. Is spot hidden truth or yeah. spot signs of deception, spot signs of deception stress. So yes, there's some science around it. There's some psychology around it. You can certainly improve your awareness and get better at it. Mm. Absolutely. I've got a program, perceptive interviewing or evaluating truthfulness and credibility that absolutely has helped people go, oh my God, I now see things I didn't see before. That's really, really helpful in the mm. business sense or an interview sense. Um, then the other one is, the next one along is seek. So this is about, the, as we said before, 
I want the truth from you, but what could I do? And there's no magic wand or silver bullet, but what might I do differently to increase the likelihood that you're going to tell me the truth? So I have to think through that. Why might she lie? What's at stake for her? How do I make that safer? How can I prime you to, to be more truthful? So when I talk about, and I do this in my interviewing skills program, is creating a truth-telling environment, it's actually getting into the, to that sort of stuff. Uh-huh. And, and it's thinking around, how can I condition you? And also, one of the things that I do in that is ask people to be honest in our interview. If I'm interviewing you, there's a way to do it, there's a way not to do it. It takes a bit more of a lesson. But if I've asked you to be truthful and you have said yes... Now, if you lie, which you still can, your choice, you can jump on the spectrum wherever you like, but now if I ask you to lie, two things have to happen. One, you've got to tell me the original lie, and two, you need to go against your word to me. Yeah. It's like a double whammy. Yeah. So you can still do it and step on the deception spectrum down the deception end, yeah. but the likelihood of me being able to now spot deception stress has just increased because not only are you lying, you're also breaking your word. Yeah, yeah. So it's a double whammy. Yeah, so there's always little tricky things that you can do when you know how okay. to actually do it. So, so spot spot deception. Uh, seek the other one is speak about okay. speaking truth. That's a big rabbit hole about speaking truth to self, speaking truth to others, um, speaking truth about. Uh, I, I presented at a, a conference that was about bullying and um, workplace bullying, school bullying, and it, they talked about the bystander effect, people knowing that it's going on. I know that you're bullying that person and it's not okay, but I don't want to get involved. Or I know that something is happening and it's not okay, but that's not really my business. Mm. And so I stand back and let it happen and I don't speak up. Yeah. And um, yeah, I know I had an incident in the, in the police force where something happened to me as a, as a rookie and I didn't speak Yeah, share that up. story with us because that's quite a powerful one. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, okay, so rewind. I was 22, freshly graduated, had done the city traffic thing, directing traffic, <laughs> trying to catch shoplifters. Are you the hot blonde? <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you weren't allowed to wear makeup. The policewoman these days, you look at them and they look glamorous. I'm like, yeah, but... Oh, <laughs> back in the back day. Then, it's like, no makeup. <laughs> Pull your hair back. <laughs> look like a bad. <laughs> But, but I, um, in this case, you had to get your police driver's license. So I was at my first police station, which was Brighton Police Station in Melbourne. And you had to go off to this other police station to do a driving test to get your police driver's license. So I'd had my car driver license for four years. Good driver, no incidents. Went to this particular station. I think you did a quick written test. But then you went for an hour drive with a, a sergeant or a qualified person and they'd get you to you know, do all these things. And that was good. I was very confident. Um, we were having a bit of banter on the way. It was all good. We're driving along and in an area that I didn't know on the other side of town. And so we kept on driving out, driving out. And then all of a sudden we're out in, there was not much out there. There was a new housing estate, no houses yet. And he said, go down that dirt path there because I want to see how you handle the police car on the dirt track. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's like, it goes faster. Just spin it round, and I'm like, you sure? Yeah. So it was fun. It was like really cool. I'm yeah, spinning yeah, yeah. the police car, spinning the wheels. Um, anyway, he goes, okay, stop the car now. And I said, yeah, that was that was really good. You're doing really well. And I'm like, yeah, thanks, thanks. And then it was sort of silent for a while, and I was looking out the window, and then I turned around, and he's actually unzipped his pants, and got this out, oh, and wow. and I was like, was was just this shock of. I was on a high from skidding the, yeah, yeah, the yeah, dirt road until yeah. all of a sudden this sergeant had unzipped his pants and he goes, hey, do you want to have a bit of fun? And I said, what? Uh, and I was so shocked. Like even now as I tell the story, my heart, I can feel my heartbeat mm. increasing. And he, he said, come on, help me out here. We'll have a bit of fun. And I said, no, like what the? And, um, and he said, do you want your license? Uh. And I said, yeah, yes. And he goes, come on, help, help me out. Come on, you'll like it. And I said, no, no, I'm 22, remember. 22, just starting this new career. Yeah. Now I'm a strong woman. I, I like, but, but this was really confronting. I'm like, whoa. And you're sitting in the middle of nowhere, right? So, I, there was no one around. Yeah, I, yeah. There was no one around. And I felt so... I was scared. I was vulnerable. I like, I don't know. 
I'm not going there, but I don't know how, how to, get, to out. get out. Like, do I get out of the police car? Do I run away? No, that's stupid. Like, I actually froze. And he goes, come on, it won't take long. I'm like, okay. <laughs> As if that's an incentive. Um, and I said, no, 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 please, can we go? Can we please go? And he said, you're short. Like, it, it was, you know, there was a fair few, I don't know how many minutes it was, but it yeah, seemed like... It felt like a So... We drove back. He said, okay, let's go back to the... And the whole, obviously, dynamic in the police car changed then. And I'm just like, mm, driving, driving back. I was, my heart was racing. I was like, shit, like, what just happened? And because I was so flustered, I ended up going through a stop sign. And um, I didn't crash or anything. But then he goes, oh, you just went through a stop sign. That's a fail. And I was like, what? And he goes, well, no. And he said, a couple of other things you've done wrong too, but that's, you won't be passing your, your test. And I like, still couldn't process it. And as we got back to the station, he said, of course, you won't be telling anyone about our little fun, will you? Mm. And so my brain is like, I want to speak truth. I want to tell what just happened. What's going to happen to me? That no one's going to believe me. He's going to say that didn't happen. He's going to say I made it up. Um, I'm going to, people are going to make fun of me. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to, uh, you just, it was a mess in my head. And so I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell anyone for years and years and years. My whole police career, I didn't tell anyone. And I got back to the station, my my station, and they said, did you get your license? And I I said, no, Um, I didn't. And they said, why? And I said, I went through a stop sign, which was the truth, Mm -hmm. but not the whole truth. Yeah. And, and it was only recently I, I, I wrote an article on LinkedIn about it because uh, I thought, I think there's a bigger message. It's not about me anymore. That's, yeah. that's done and dusted. It's could my story prompt one person or a hundred people, male, female, it doesn't matter, to actually think about that story, that truth that they're holding on to that is, you know, causing, holding them back from success or causing somebody to not be exposed as he should have been Mm. um and yeah so that that was sort of that was traumatic and still to this day because i guess it just has memory cells of trauma there yeah yes people have been through more traumatic things but at that stage that was about the most traumatic comparison yeah that's it and uh but and thankfully when i did that article and posted on, on on linkedin victoria police got in touch with me and uh, said, really sorry that that happened. I know it's a long time ago, but would you like some help? Would you like some counselling? Uh, which I was surprised. I didn't expect to get that. Well, and they, they followed up. They said, look, we're, that's not the first story that we have like that from that division of the mm. police force. And we are working really, really hard to stamp all of that. Wow, that's amazing. Out. So, yeah, so that, that sort of impacted, I think, on, on my life, even as a parent with daughters like there was a couple of things that happened in the police force that made me fearful for them yeah and and tried I I probably was a bit of a hard ass as a mum when they were growing up Um, tough love's going to make them tougher so they don't have to go through some of the the things that I went through so yeah yeah. so that's the speak truth so I think just actually thinking about that's so powerful because honestly so often we don't speak our truth you know because of our conditioning mm. so um but if you are if our audience is interested in um helping them create a truthful environment in their workplace or whether it's for the dating where can they get hold of you i think the best place is to go to my website because that's always evolving and growing and adding and that's elliejohnson.com yes um and there, there's going to be some new fantastic stuff cool. in the coming months so jump check it board. out yeah, yeah get we'll in touch send, it, send us an email <laughs> say hi, hi. <laughs> say this is my truth um and my favorite question <gasps> <laughs> what is your red hot truth and how are you living it my red hot truth is that i was put on this planet to help others have happier time on this planet and I've had to go through my own version of struggle to get to a point that I think I've got something of value to do that and that's what I will do until I take my last breath is think how can I channel information experiment assimilate shape it into something that can help someone else and that's where I get my you know 
joy from. That's mm. my red hot truth. Very nice. Well, Amy Johnson, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, fabulous woman on fire. I trust that this interview helped you get closer to your red hot truth. So give it a thumbs up. Remember to subscribe. Thank you for supporting the Red Hot Truth and we'll see you next time.